<laughs> this is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, and a new experience. Welcome to the Geese Spot Podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love sound bites. Join us for conversations around sex, spirit, and all things self-care. All things self-care. All things self-care. This is a journey into You are a G-Swap podcast with Katie Silcox. Hey, my loves. Today's podcast is brought to you by Ahara Ghee, our favorite ghee, the best ghee in the world. It is made from the milk of A2 cows over an open flame, not in kettles. And did you know that ghee is used for so many things? You know, it's not just for Indian cooking. Ghee can be used anywhere you would use any kind of oil. Frying, sauteing. I love ghee so much because it's got a really high set point for the flame. And that means that the ghee can take a lot of heat before it begins to break down. Unlike other oils like olive oil, uh, ghee is something that, you know, you can really let, let that fire burn in. So check out our favorite brand, Ahara Ghee. We've got the link as always in our show notes. And don't forget to head over to their recipe pages where you can find some of the yummiest ways you can use ghee. I know all of you are having a haragi in your house. On to the show. So today we have a very interesting topic. It's something I've been thinking a lot about. You know, I, like so many other people, I never really questioned the so-called ancient roots of the yoga I was doing. And I started to read books about the history of yoga, the kind of yoga that I know I and so many of us have been practicing. I had been under the impression for so many years that there was something inherently sacred and profound about downward and upward dogs and warrior one and two. I thought that squeezing and twisting myself into these fun named position carried with it thousands of years of experience. And then I started to read books because I started to question that. My body started to want to do different movements and and, uh, more circular movements. When I started to develop something that I called the feminine form flow, I also started to read really incredible books like The Great Om, The Subtle Body, The Science of Yoga, The Roots of Yoga, and The Yoga Body, and all of these books that I'll give you guys some links to if you also want to read um, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are, are things that I found out from these books, and they made a, an incredibly profound impact on my understanding of what may be a little bit of a closer version of the truth to the story of the yoga that we're all practicing. And, and then it was really the scholar Mark Singleton who guided me into what I feel like might be a, a deep truth around what I was calling yoga. According to a lot of, to, to Mark and a lot of yoga scholars, the books being referenced as the manuals for ancient yoga, like the Yoga Sutras or the Hatha Yoga Pradipika or the Garanda Samhita, those books actually mention no standing poses at all, but are largely comprised of weird means for cleansing the body, as well as multiple variations on cross-legged seated positions. And those, um, Positions were all about moving and channeling and even stopping energy in the body, as well as shutting down the primary sensing system. These books were really focused on a technique called Pratyahara, which is a means whereby you shut down your biology. And by shutting down the biology and stopping the flow of prana, guess what happens? The mind starts to initially freak out, but then calm down, uh, which could be good, but could also mean that you're really testing the limits of the nervous system, uh, which in the end can lead towards death. So warrior poses, upward dog, downward dog, all of the standing positions, in fact, were not present at all. Singleton found the origins of these standing poses may be from the early 20th century. Guys, that's, that's very recent. That's the 19, 1900s. 
And guess where they came from? They came from European calisthenic exercise routines. He traces it back to one early Danish system of dynamic exercise called primitive gymnastics, whose poses are eerily similar to what we have been calling ancient Indian yoga. Um, the creator of the Scandinavian gymnastics system had never been to any, uh, nor had ever studied, you know, never been to India, nor had they studied with any Indian system of movement or philosophy. So Mark was like, what's going on here? Um, guess what else? The movements, these primitive gymnastics from, from Denmark, were also accompanied by a series of creepily similar hallmarks of the yoga practice we use today, which is the five count method of holding poses, as well as the abdominal locks and dynamic jumps, a la Ashtanga and modern pop vinyasa yoga. So I was like, oh my goodness, this is so freaky and I'm annoyed, but also this is so beautiful, right? This thing that I've thought is so esoteric and foreign to me was, could be a, a fusion with these European primitive gymnastics. Singleton really showed me how this 19th century Scandinavian gymnastic tradition had become a touchstone for all European exercise during that time period, you guys, including its use as the basis for physical training regimes in the army and navy and many school systems. Then this European system migrated to India in the early 1900s, not the other way around. And so by the year 1920, this form of primitive gymnastics was one of the most popular forms of exercise in the whole of India, according to a study survey done by the YMCA. So in other words, the thing we call yoga in the West, uh, this sort of thing we adore and exoticize as ancient and Indian couldn't be less exotic for many of us. At best, the modern yoga we practice today can be considered this beautiful hybrid of Northern European gymnastics blended with all the beauty and, and wonderfulness of the ancient mysticism and philosophy and really of modern Hinduism. And so I really believe that yoga is far from a cultural appropriation, but more a complete exemplar of cultural blending and as Mark Singleton says, cultural blending and cultural transmigration writ large. I love the words of Singleton. I'm going to give you another quote from him. He says, clearly, there was more to the story than I have been told, he writes. My foundation was shaken, to say the least. If I was not participating in an ancient venerable tradition, what exactly was I doing? Was I heir to an authentic yoga practice or the unwitting perpetrator of a global fraud? What is more, after spending the next four years of his life researching asana yoga, Singleton came to the conclusion that classical tradition of his yoga rarely, if ever, mentioned yoga poses. And the few poses that were mentioned were not used for health, but for transcending the body and the senses. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to contemplate. And what I hope that it, it does is broaden your understanding of the origins of the thing that we're doing called yoga. And what I also hope it does for all of my listeners, which I know so many of you do yoga, so many of you are yoga teachers, so many of you feel so grateful to India as a cultural mother for so many of the, the practices. And we want to in no way appropriate, but to honor the deep traditions of India that so many of us are borrowing from, um, but at the same time to really recognize this cultural transmigration and cultural blending that has been happening since the early 20th century with modern movement forms. Um, Singleton's book actually describes a, a, an even more primary origin point for the gymnastics practices. And what he found was that these early Danish gymnastics were, are coming from actually women and movement teachers, female, just for fun, I thought I'd add that in, uh, female um, movement teachers. What was so shocking to me about Singleton's research was the discovery that the West had been developing its own forms of movement, we, we could even call it yoga, i.e. health and gymnastics and movement and dance practices that really resemble this modern yoga far before 
the introduction of the yoga flows that we got from Patabi Joyce or the long-held poses that we got from Mr. Iyengar. What is more, these practices were developed by and large by and for women, you guys. They included all of the hallmarks of what we so fervently think and believe to be the male lineage India esoteric arts. We think the body movement, the poses, the breath work, the relaxation methodologies, and all of these things that move towards positive thinking and altered states of consciousness, we think that that's only from these male-dominated lineages, which I'm not throwing off on, and I want everyone to get that abundantly clear. There are some beautiful lineages, there are some beautiful practices, but we have been hoodwinked and brainwashed into thinking that it's from an all-male lineage from India, when in fact... There are the women who are the progenitors of these practices and these fusions have names. Kaj Zajoran Ali, Genevieve Stebbins, Molly Baggett Stack. These are the names of some of the women leading the wave of 20th century physical cultural traditions. Have you ever heard of Kaj Zajoran Ali? Genevieve Stebbins or Molly Baggett Stack? I bet you haven't, <laughs> but you've definitely heard of Patabi Joyce, you've heard of Iyengar, you've heard of uh, Desika Char, you've heard of Krishnamacharya, which we thank them and thank you so much for all the gifts that you've given and no thank you for some of the things that were done by some of those men that were not so great. Uh, but why haven't we heard of these women? Well, I'm going to take you to the words of Angela Farmer, one of my dear beloved friends and, and inspirations who we were so honored to have teach in our original Sex God and Yoga conference. And she describes this beautiful story of, of Parvati down by the river, moving her body and basking in the sunlight and naked as a jaybird swishing her thighs left to right, her hips undulating like a hula dancer. She just moved. She didn't need any permission. She just knew how to enjoy her own body and her own pleasure. And she was tapped into the pranatana, this tantric word that means the sahaja, this tantric word also that the sahaja means this free form and the pranatana means this movement of energy with inside the body that moves us in the sahaja, this free form. So Parvati was connected to that. And of course, there was a little sneaky Shiva god hidden in the bushes watching her, which of course he was, because what is more beautiful than a woman moving her form from the, from the power of her own heart and from the power of her own life force? And he began to watch her move, which many of her movements were designed to make her strong, to make her flexible, but also, and more importantly, to make her creative, right? Her, her birthing poses, her horse stance, her goddess pose, her squats, her her movements of undulation and circularity were about her creativity and her capacity to purify once a month as a bleeding, mensating woman. Is mensating a word? I don't know. I just made that up. So Shiva sees her and is so inspired by how beautiful and creative and strong and life luscious she's becoming, Shiva starts to copy her. Shiva starts to codify it. Shiva starts to write it down. Shiva starts to teach her training program. Shiva starts to certify people at the Yoga Alliance, <laughs> which is not bad or wrong, my loves. It's just to say it's one side of the story. And so I just want us to have permission to remember our mother, to remember our roots, to remember women like Kajazora and Ali, Genevieve Stebbins, Molly Baggett Stack. If they're still alive, would someone let us know? I don't think so. I think they're long gone. But maybe one of you out there, I don't have time, maybe one of you out there can research these women and Amari will put their names in the show notes and you can tell us about their lineage. Maybe they're still out there. And guess what, my loves? They called this physical cultural tradition that these women were developing in Europe, they called it harmonial movements. And just to say that to you, it makes me cry. That is a part of our story. Harmonial movements, 
from Northern Europe, and it traveled all the way throughout all of Europe, and Europe brought those traditions to India. And India, and it took it to the Army of India, and the Army took it to the YMCA, and the YMCA was a, played a huge role in the development of what we now call modern yoga. And Indians who were very, very excited about talking about the um, scientific and health-based benefits began to study it and use it and now develop it. And it's so beautiful. We see this fusing of the ancient Indian with the Northern European. And I just, I think it's just a testament, you guys, to the fact that, look, no one owns any of this. We're all here on the planet. We have, in beautiful ways and in horrible ways, been in relationship with one another. And that relationship with one another forms the culture that we're all experiencing right now on this planet. And what I love is that can we take all of the greatness and all of the harmony and all of the love and all of the intelligence and science from all of these great minds, from Europe, from India, from Africa, from the United States now, can we share with one another and can we continue to do what we always do, which is inspire one another and elevate one another with our dance, with our song, with the traditions from all over this world that unite us to the one thing that unites all of us, and that is the five elements of Mother Nature. I love this idea of, of one of my friends says, the nature of good, wise information is that it wants to travel. So what's good from one culture inevitably will travel and be sucked up and utilized by another culture and we share with one another. The nature of good, wise information is that it wants to travel. And so I hope this inspires you to move your body in a harmonial way. And I hope it, it also inspires you to question everything. Question what you've been taught and do the research for yourself. Check out the books in the show notes and we hope that you will join us in this deep exploration of Ayurveda, of harmonial movements, of feminine form movements, as we do in the Lineage of Love, our monthly subscription program, which you can join for the low, low price <laughs> of $18 a month, which is cray cray, because when you join for $18 a month, you don't get this month's teachings. You don't get this month's video and meditation. You get every single one we've ever done. You get my entire compendium of videos and audios. You get all of it when you join, even for a day. So get your hot, hot booty in the lineage of love and join us for our more intensive year long program. You know about it. You guys, we can't stop talking about Shakti schools, Ayurveda certification program, which starts in January. We already have around a hundred women signed up. They are women from all over this planet. And it makes me so excited and so proud of what we are creating over here, which is, just a web of love and education and empowerment for a web of women all over this world, all shapes, all sizes, all nationalities. That's us. We love it. So join me. And we've got about, I don't know, I'm a email. I have to tell me, I think we're up to about 20 teachers. You guys, our teachers also live all over the world and um, they're going to be helping me out next year. So we do have a cutoff. And so that might be a little kick in the booty to get in now if you know that you want to join us. All right, my loves, have a beautiful and blessed day. Put the pull.